remember when the um, Queen of Sheba came and visited um, the people of God, and what did she what did she say? You know, people are walking by sight. Just because you don't walk by sight, you walk by faith, doesn't mean that other people aren't walking by sight. You know, several, well, about a month ago, um, well, longer ago than that, Pastor Greg bought me um, this really, really nice perfume. I didn't need any perfume, but he was at the store and he was like, I want to buy you some perfume, pick out, and I've never worn any of these kinds before, and they have like multiples to choose from. And he was like, come to the store and pick one out. And I was like, I don't need any perfume. I'm fine with the perfume that I have. He was like, no, I want to buy you one. So I found this one, and y'all, it's like my favorite one of all time now. Like, it's like the one that you only wear, like, every other day because, like, you want to, like, expand its life. Not to mention, um, it's in a store that's, like, not around here, not where we normally go. Like, they only sell it in one designer store. So anyway, you get the perfume. Long story short, I'm out of the perfume, so I'm like, Heather, can you order me some more of this perfume? So she orders it, and it comes in, and you would have thought that I won like a pot of gold. (laughs) The way that it's packaged, the box that it's in, the card that's included with it, the whole thing. And so I opened it and I thought, oh, this is going in my collection of stuff because every time somebody brings me a document that's not cut straight for the house of the Lord... I want to introduce them to this box of perfume. Because I don't like, like, this is, like, we are the church. You guys didn't just get up today and go, like, come to my serve in the parking lot or what? No, this is like God's house. And so I opened it and I didn't need it because I still had some left in the other bottle and went away to do some things and um, came back and, you know, Heather had, done a lot of things, and I was like, hey, you didn't get rid of that box, and she was like, oh, no, I knew immediately, like, she just knew, like, you don't have to get it to me, do you have it, though, it's here, huh, oh, you could get it, that'd be great, Um, she was like, oh, no, I knew, I knew that you wouldn't get rid of the box, which I'm so thankful for people who, like, know, but guys, what you do, your families, like, your businesses, like, people are walking by sight, you are advertising the king of kings, Every single day, not just in your person. And again, that doesn't have to be expensive, but it does have to have a smile. It does have to be the very best, whatever that looks like. And so not really our content today. The title is, What Do You See?, And we're going to jump into that. We're still talking about vision and we'll probably wrap up today because there were three things that we wanted to look at. If we want to experience the abundant life that Jesus has provided for us this year in a significant way, um, like we've heard experiencing like Christmas every day of the year, that's going to require three things of us. Number one was vision. And so that's where we've kind of been focused. Write this down just so that we get our heads back into this vision game. Vision for your life starts with the word. Vision for your life starts with the word. And then it moves into God's inspired instructions for your life. Congratulations on your magnificent of glory. How do you say that? Bulgari, whatever. It's like, you can't just throw all the letters. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. I don't know how to say it. It's a, what? Oh, my God. Okay, so when you open it, and if you're online and you have access to this all the time, we're, we're in, like, the sticks down here. So, so we're literally ooing and aahing over a box right now. It's fine. Um, okay, and so it's, you know, it's, Now, this tissue paper wasn't my favorite color. I thought they could have done better with that, but you open this card, you know, and it moves. Let's go. How cool is that? I'm I'm opening it. I'm like, these people don't even believe in Jesus, you know, and Christians don't send cards anymore, you know, because that's expensive or something. Good night, everybody. Have a good day. <laughs> like, wow, this, 
This jump star is going over like a lead balloon, and it's hot in here, so we need to get some air cranking somewhere in my direction. Or, thank you, Pastor Kathy. <laughs> People are walking by sight. So vision for your life starts with the word, and then it moves into God's inspired instructions. What, write this down. Without vision, you have no focus, you will have no family, and you will be a broke vessel. Now, that's not on the screen. But without vision, you will have no focus, you will have no family, and you will be a broke vessel. You know, I heard Brother Keith Moore um, mention years and years ago that he was driving in, um, I don't know if it was L.A., but it was downtown, which it could be downtown in a lot of major cities in the United States right now. And there's such homelessness and despair. And what came up in his heart was no vision. Can't just throw money at these problems. This is not a money problem. This is a vision problem. These people have no vision. So without vision, you will have no focus. You will have no family. Because God's vision for your life isn't isolating you from a company. Right? What, are, what did Peter and John do after they were released from prison, after they had been beaten? Um, they went to their own company. So vision actually enhances your, your relationship with your company. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, people who do drugs, people who are, uh, allow addictions in their life, whether they're sexual addictions or all of, uh, whatever, whatever they are, when they hurt their bodies, because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It houses the, the Spirit of God, but it's also what, what God is using to communicate His plan for your life. And that's why vision is so, so, so important. So I want to ask you today, what do you see? Now we know, and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is so important. The enemy's number one job in your life, we always refer to John 10.10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But he has like a preliminary motive before he's even able to steal. And we find that in 2 Corinthians 4.4. It says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So what does the enemy want to do? The enemy wants to keep your eyes blinded. That's why even praying the Ephesians prayers is so massively important. You know, certain people just, they carry a spirit of seeing and knowing. They carry a spirit of just revelation and anointing. They probably pray that prayer over themselves. Because the Holy Spirit cannot do anything in your life without your authorization. So you have to invite him to open the eyes of your understanding. To illuminate you, your family, Everybody that you have influence over. Because the enemy's job is to keep the, the, the veil there. Even after you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, he wants to keep you blinded through religious tradition, with doubt and unbelief, with so many other voices that contradict the word of God. He can't take anything from you until he first deceives you. And the only way he can deceive you is when you can't see the light. So your vision is so important, and the enemy's after your vision. He's not after your health. He's not after your destiny. He's not after your finances. All he needs is your vision, and you'll hand over your health. You'll hand over your prosperity. You'll hand over your destiny. If he takes your vision, he takes your life. So you have to understand his strategy. I've enjoyed so much the PFS this month as Pastor Dean's been talking about the light. John 1, 12, this, this weekend, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Write this statement down. What you can't see, you can't become. What you cannot see, you cannot become, which is why this starts with packing your heart first and foremost full of the word of God. And that's what, that's what preaching does. 
See, when we see in the life of Jesus that he was preaching, teaching, and laying hands on the sick, what we see there, through preaching, you're inspired. You receive hope. Through teaching, you receive instruction. If you just hear preaching, you'll never know what to do with the hope that you received. It's not enough that we just come to service and we hear anointed, inspired preaching. You can do this. You know, I heard a minister years and years ago, and I, you know, whatever. Um, And they were like, where are the preachers? We need the preachers back. Basically, like, against teachers, which is fine, like whatever. But it's just, there's nothing wrong with being inspired. God is good. He has a great plan for your life. You're anointed. You're called. You're chosen. But you got to walk out of there and do something with that. So preaching is the inspirational aspect of, of, of Jesus's ministry. But then the teaching aspect helped them to grow into that. And then he obviously demonstrated it. Well, the same thing, the same three elements in a way have to be appropriated in our lives. So yes, you have to see what the word of God says about you before you'll ever be motivated in the reality that your life actually matters. That there's something on the other side of eternity that you're gonna be held accountable for accomplishing. It doesn't matter that it may not be publicly visible. It's very much visible to the Father. You know, Paul gets enormous press, which he should. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He was an incredible apostle. But without Ananias, where's Paul? Because Ananias was Paul's first introduction to Christianity. Of all the believers that God could have assigned with the mission of being the point person, Ananias was chosen. So we have to look at things correctly and recognize wherever we're called, like your life matters. And if you're dealing with insecurities and inferiorities, man, you've got to stay in Psalms 139, 13 through 18. You've got to live there. You've You've got to over and over and over say, Father God, I thank you that you knew me before I was even formed in my mother's womb, that I'm marvelously and wonderfully made. You have to live in that place because your life very much matters. And the heavenly vision that God has for you, you're going to be accountable for. So you can't like use these excuses. It starts with accepting what he said about you. You cannot see, or excuse me, what you can't see, you can't become. So in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, you guys um, hear me use this verse a lot. All of us with unveiled faces... See, that's the purpose of the word and the spirit is to remove the blinders. That's why you even pray in the Holy Spirit. That's why you even set aside time in a fast. Every single thing that I I needed clarity on, I've received. One after another, after another, after another. When you remove your, it was always there. It was always there. So we set aside periods of time like this, praying in the Holy Ghost and the veil is removed because we've all received the same covenant, the same promises, the same goods. But if you can't see it, you will not become it. And you become, write it down, what you behold. That's what Paul's saying here. Like we are constantly being transfigured into his very own image as we continue to behold him in the word of God. So this absolutely starts with the word of God. James 1, through 25, you guys know it. We're not just listening, we're continuing in that word. And as a man looks carefully at his own face in a mirror and doesn't forget those things, he's changed. This is who I am. But the reality is the way that you work in the same way that if you will put your eyes on this, you will become this. Whatever else you put your eyes on, you will also become. So the enemy takes every kingdom process and practice and he perverts it. And so when he finds out, okay, it's God's design for humanity to look and become out of your word. I'm going to give him some words. And I'll reverse that process in the negative. So you have to ask yourself, am I number one, looking at circumstances that will keep you from moving forward in the vision of God? 
Well, we live in a blue state, so things are more challenging. I gotta be, I've said that. You go to Texas, it's different, y'all. That's just the reality. But that's an excuse. I've made that excuse, right? You look at circumstances. You look at governments. You look at situations. And the thing about it is, I have these, these, I have these dog toys up here. Because it's like, w- these are attention makers. This is a cute one. I think Pep has some new friends at Duncan. So Laura bought this for her. Does this one make more noise? You know what I mean? Like once you open your mouth and you yield, the enemy's like, over here, over here, over here, over here. Look at what they're saying on the news. Look at the price of gas. Look at it. You know, it could be something with your kids. Look, your kid's being an idiot again. Look, 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 look over here, look over here. You know what I'm saying? Just to get your attention. Are you looking at that? Are you looking at circumstances? Second Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith, not by sight. You're going to get up, you're going to get to heaven and like give an excuse for your circumstances. This is the greatest time to be alive. Well, there's just inflation and there's just all these things and, you know, people are having surgery and stuff. Y'all, John George just went up here and said, P-E-N-I-S, like a boss. And y'all wonder, (laughs) you don't ever need to wonder. Me and Pastor Dean seed and then following him around for... Are you looking at the world? What happened when Lot, Genesis 13, 12, separated himself from Abraham? The Bible says he pitched his tent toward Sodom. And before long, he moved, he he lived there. He was on the outskirts, but every morning, the visual would be that you would walk out your front door and there would be gross darkness. But the lights and all the action was so appealing that before long, they moved all the way into the city. Right? It's a slow fade. One little step at a time. One little compromise at a time. Because you're following the model of the world. Number three, are you looking at the past? Well, this happened and this happened. And you keep talking about it. I was in growth track last um, Sunday. And obviously going through things with some new people and um, from a neighboring community. And they're like, hey, so-and-so told us to tell you hi. Um, you know, they just knew that you would remember them. And so they told me so-and-so's name, and I was like, oh, oh, wow. I don't remember them. And they're going to be expecting to hear report back that, like, I remembered and I gave my greetings. And I'm like, do you guys have a picture of her? And they're like, no, we're not on social media. You know, we're, and I was like, okay, I'll take matters in my own hands. So I just started Googling myself. So I, and when I, I was like, oh, I found her. And, and I like, cause I, apparently I was like her mentor in high school. And I was like, high school, that was like how many lifetimes ago? And I'm like, oh my gosh, Holy Spirit. Like I was her mentor. Holy cow. I should remember her. Could not for, I, gone gone. You cannot move forward with people who are in your past. Now, I remembered her, but I was amazed because I'm not like old, but I had no, you just rehearse stuff. You just rehearse stuff, how it was, how you felt back then, how it used to be. That has nothing to do with now. And when you're so hung up and sentimentally attached to your past, or you're so full of guilt and shame, you can't, your arms are too full, so to speak, to receive what is necessary for now. So whenever, remember God spared Lot and his family, even though he still lost everything. In Genesis 19, 26, the angel had appeared to Lot and said, like, head for the hills and like, don't look back. And what did Lot's wife do? But look back. You just think about it. I wonder what they're up to. Just remember what it used to be like. Or what it didn't used to be like. I just remember when they rejected me. Why would you want to remember that? Do you remember what they said about me? No, I actually forgot about that immediately. And I forgave the person that told me that as if I wanted to care. Do you know what I mean? You're just looking back. Why? 
It's not how it used to be. Well, I just don't know what went wrong. These are mysteries that would, you don't have the answers. What difference does it make? The situation is wrong. There's nothing you can do about it. Pray in the Holy Spirit, but you gotta, you gotta keep stepping. Well, what if it happens again? Uh, it probably won't. That's what I know. I'm not the same person. There'll always be people who, according to Mark 4, get offended for the word, get distracted by the word. That's always going to be there. But I'm, I'm changing. I'm not the same. So I'm not going to fear the past. I'm not going to fear repeating the past. I'm not going to think about the past. The past will steal your present and your future from you. So you can't look at that. And if the enemy knows that you'll get all nostalgic, you know, you got all these old pictures everywhere. No, you're talking about it. The phone will even remind you. There's so many demonic things about this thing. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm not being ugly. I mean, somebody sent me a picture that had come up in their memories from like 2017. The only reason I knew it was 2017 was because we were at a conference and the lanyard said 2017. Because I looked at that and I was like, who is that girl? And not her, but me. I was like, who is that girl? Who is that? 2017, that's like three, peop- th- three persons ago. At least. At least. One year ago, I look at myself and I'm like, oh girl, what were you thinking? What were you even doing? Because you, you should be growing. I don't care anything about that memory from 27. And I'm not being ugly. I love you. And you're probably watching. But like you're programmed in that. They're even programming you in that sort of nostalgia. You remember when? Are you looking at others? Remember when Peter was looking at John in John 21, 20 through 22? Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple that Jesus loved, the one who leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? And Peter asked, what about him, Lord? And Jesus replied, what about him? Like, that's none of your business. That's none of your business. As for you, you just follow me. You know, people think that God's talking to them about other people. He's not. He's not. He's not talking to you about other people. You go before him because you want answers about other people. That is radio silence. And whatever spirit you feel like you're hearing is not his spirit. Because he's not, he's not having conversations about other people. Well, I just feel in my spirit that they're doing this and this and this. Well, you know, we all have a little feeling in our spirit. You know what I'm saying? I have a little feeling in my spirit today. Like, why is it this cold outside? You know what I'm saying? Like, that had nothing to do with the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost. I don't care nothing about your feeling. You know, I just feel like they're offended. I feel like I don't care if they are. What difference does that make? I'm not going to go there in my head. That doesn't mean I'm ugly. But that just means how am I going to go forward? I've already got five reasons to be paralyzed right now. We're in a blue state. What are my other ones? Let's just make this quicker. We're in a blue state. People don't want their parts anymore. They want different ones. People in the past rejected me. People right now are doing different things than I'm doing. Number five is just, are you looking at nonsense? Just wasted time. You know, God wants you to enjoy life. There's funny things that you can, you can enjoy, you know, but there's just so much nonsense, nonsense on YouTube. Like there's just so many things that you can just waste time with. And I'm not talking about not having a good laugh, but I'm talking about wasting time on nonsense. So as we close, because I have a tool that I want to give you today, I want to tie these things up with 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And not because it says the greatest of these is love, but because there are three spiritual laws here. That was a funny joke. Nobody laughed. It's okay. Um, And these three abide, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. These are three laws. These are spiritual laws. The law of hope, the law of faith, and the law of love. Hope is the vision. Hope is always the blueprint. Okay? That's why preaching is so important. We have to give people hope. The word paints a picture for them for a better life. And not just a better life, a supernatural life. 
Okay, there's a lot of people that are living a better life today than maybe they did 45 years ago because of a career, because of investment. I'm not talking about a better life that you can accomplish in and of yourself. I'm talking about a supernatural life. The word will reveal that to you. That becomes the vision. That becomes the blueprint. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. Proverbs 10, 24 says, the hopes of the godly will be granted. Proverbs 10, 28 says, the hopes of the godly result in happiness. And Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no vision, the people perish. So people need hope. I need hope. I need vision. I need the blueprint of the word of God first and foremost, but then the inspired vision, which is why you've got to sit down. You've got to write. You've got to imagine. You've got to work with the Holy Spirit to put supernatural on whatever you're assigned to do and begin to dream. Faith now these three remain faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Faith or the word is the power. If hope is the blueprint, faith is the power behind it, driving it. Remember, I said several weeks ago, the Holy Spirit had said to me, you have to take me at my word before I can perform it. So you receive the inspired instructions from him and then you put the word of God on that. You put the word of God on that. You don't just have the word of God and believe that it's able to do supernaturally. What supernatural things has God called you to do? What supernatural things has God called you to do in your family? What supernatural things has God called you to do in business? What supernatural things has God called you to do in your church? Not just that you serve, but I, you know, it's my, I believe that Lord could use my life and use my family, that we could connect five families our family could connect five families to this church in the next three months. I could, I could partner with five other families and see to it that they stay on track. They accomplish growth track. Your church life, not just showing up and serving. That's the least that we can do. That's like paying the mortgage on your home. Well, of course you would do that for your family. Provide a place for them. Pay cash for it, whatever. But that's not, okay, you guys have a place to live. We'll see you later. You think that there's more to what you can do than just what you're doing right now. And when you stop seeing that, guess what happens? You go on to glory or you get offended and quit. Right? So you have to have a vision for for your connections in, in every one of these places, but then you have to put the word of God on it. Faith is hope's substance. And then love is the action. So in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, we see all these that are necessary. Just like hope is to preaching, what faith is to teaching, what demonstrating is to love. You find out what God's word says about you and then what God says to you. And that gives you hope. You know, if you've ever set out to something new, a uh, uh, business or whatever, it had to be real to you before it came through you. Yeah. It had to be something that you were excited about. But we have a covenant full of promises that enable us to be the head and everything that we put our hands to to prosper. So for us to not be kicking butt and taking names is a huge indictment, especially to people who claim to believe this. But it's not enough that you believe it. You have to do something with it. And you have to see how it specifically applies to your situation. And set your hope for that. Then apply the word to that. And then you got to get going. Faith without works, James 2.17, is dead. So everything we do, we do in love. Let all you do be done in love. We know that. 1 Corinthians 14.16. Let me make sure, because I don't have that in my notes. Oh, I don't even want to look it up because I know, but I will, because Noah's got time for this. Is it 16? 
And don't like sit there and try to help. Like you're too late. I can look it up. Sixteen. First Corinthians sixteen fourteen. Let all your things, all your things. So Mark 12, and I like this in the Passion, verse 30. You are to love the Lord Yahweh with your God with every passion. Say every passion. All the energy of your being. I like this. With every thought that is within you. Which is why according to 2 Corinthians 10, 4, you got to cast some down. Because some people can't fulfill the plan of God for their life because their own thoughts are in the way. And it's nobody else's job to steward your head. That's your job. So if the thought does not love God and it, if, if it does not work towards the vision, I'm not going to yield to it. I don't need that. That's in my way. Because I'm going to be accountable for accomplishing these things in my life. And uh, my mom rejected. You, you can't have that. That's got to get out of the way. That's not going to be an excuse. We all have new promises now. We all have a new family now. So with every thought. So if I can't love him with that thought, I got to get rid of it. With all your strength, every passion of your heart, this is the action, which means what he shows you to do that you mix faith with, that you put faith with, you're going to have to do. You're going to have to do. You're going to have to actually get up and have a joy about your life, have a peace about your life in spite of, because what does the enemy always, he comes to steal the word, but he can only steal from people who don't have a focus, right? Like those people with the little shakers at the basketball games behind the, the basket, the people make the free throws because they've practiced. They're not bothered by all of this. So many Christians Well, the day we get going in the right direction, kids need training. Kids make bad choices. You know, like there are people around us that are, we live in a fallen world and you, one little thing. And this is what you have to know. Isn't it the thing like Job 325 says, the thing that I so greatly feared, we actually came to church to avoid this. And now I've got the same. Well, of course, that's exactly what's going to happen because that's what you fear. That's what you fear. You didn't set out Proverbs 22, 6 to raise your kids in the admonition of the Lord. And when they grew up, they would not depart from it. You feared that they would depart from it. And so you set out to override that fear. That does, that's not faith. Those, are, those look different. Those look different. Because there's a, there's a focus. There's a stability about that vision that brings joy that causes you to be aware of where all the iPads and the tablets are before they're in the wrong place or not even distributing them. I have something for you. We're going to pass out. And this is just a tool for you. And what it is, if you've already written, like nothing that you hear or receive from here should ever be bondage or make life worse. So if you do that with what you're given, that's an issue that you should resolve within yourself. So if you've already got something in writing, you've already got, then don't use this. Don't, don't even be bothered by this. But what it is, is it's a place for you to act on everything that you just received. So obviously, and, and then you have to keep it before you. So what do you see? First of all, it starts with your personal life. Now, this can be your, your person. I always think of your personal life for me as it pertains to my soul and my body. So your thought life and then how you steward your body. Now, if it means something different to you, you're not turning this in. This is simply for you. But what you do is, and you quiet yourself with the help of the Holy Spirit, and you like dream, like what would, I, what would be the best case scenario Like for me, I'm happy, I'm joyful, you know, I'm this weight and not because so-and-so's this weight, but because I know that would be best for me. That's when I feel the best. Does that make sense? And then you put the word on that, whatever scriptures. And then you, 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 you have to plan and your vision should turn into a plan. So what am I going to do now? I'm not eating fast food anymore. I'm going to meal prep whatever that looks like. I'm going to get up every single day and I'm going to do things that bring me joy instead of waking up late, running out of the house. 
I'm going to have the, the creamer in my fridge that I enjoy. I'm going to like set myself up for a win. I'm going to buy the perfume that I like. I'm going to quit being a weirdy. Like I'm saving God money. I need new sheets. <laughs> I'm going to get rid of things that are like old and stop squeezing the toothpaste that causes frustration every day. I'm going to, I'm never, I'm not going to buy one tube of toothpaste at a time. I'm going to buy four. You know what I mean? Like, what am I going to do? What are the peace thieves? And then you go through your family life, you know, with your kids. And then you make a plan. Like, how is this going to be? My church life. You know, I already gave you some ideas. It's not just that you're serving because I'm talking to leaders. But, but what, are, what is the benefit of your serving? Like, how are we really connecting people? Who are you spending time with? You know, when Pastor Greg and I first moved here, you know, if every time there was a new couple at church, we made it our mission to go out with them as the pastors. Like, we became their friends. Now, that becomes awkward over time as you develop soul ties with people and they lay down their guard and so they start bringing out the alcohol. But we weren't moved by that. We just knew they needed to be connected. And so we took them out. As an extension of their ministry, we made them feel connected. We weren't even married at the time. We went out of town on trips with married couples. Not because we needed friends, but because we knew our responsibility as connectors. That's your responsibility, not just to clock in and clock out, but even like how you're clocking in. Like what a delight it is today that we get to serve. But not just serve people, but like make ourselves available to connect with people. I don't have, I don't have, listen, I have, ve- I have very little in common with 98% of the population. <laughs> 98%. So if I can connect with people, anybody can connect with people. Your spiritual life, you know, reading the book of the month, whatever, whatever it is, what do you see for yourself? I see myself, you know, you're, if you're a student, your student life, your work life, your calling and career. I gave you a couple places there for other. And then at the back, that um, slide that we had on the screen. Work with this this week if it, would, if it would help you. Again, if you already have a place and you've already written things down, just give the, turn it back in. Like, you don't even have to take it. I don't want things to be harder. I just wanted you to see how simple it is in faith, hope, and love.